So uh, I'm going to talk about tube null sets. Uh, first, I will introduce tube null sets. Um, these are uh, in the d-dimensional Euclidean space. You just take a straight line, and you take the r neighborhood of this straight line for some positive radius r. So <coughs> in the plane, uh, this is simply just a uh, strip. So you have this straight line, and then uh, you take the R neighborhood, uh, which in this case will be just this uh, region between these two parallel lines. And um, by WT, uh, we will denote the width of this strip. Uh, so in, in the plane, uh, this is just the um, distance of these two parallel lines. And uh, in the three-dimensional uh, space, uh, tubes are really just tubes like this, tubes around some straight line. Uh, and uh, in, in higher dimension, uh, the cross section will be an n minus one dimensional ball. And wt will just denote the n minus one dimensional measure of this n minus one dimensional ball. So this is, this is what we call a tube. Uh, and this is what we call the <coughs> width of a tube. So tube null sets uh, are sets that can be uh, covered uh, by, well, in the plane, covered by strips with arbitrarily small total uh, widths. So uh, for any positive epsilon, uh, we can find uh, strips, countably many of them, uh, such that they cover uh, our set and such that uh, the sum of their widths uh, is less than epsilon. So if this is true for any epsilon, then we uh, call the set tube null set. So why are... Does this give rise to an actual measure? Does it take a minimum, a minimum, a of covering? Um, yeah, uh, it can, but uh, <coughs> the measurable sets with respect to this uh, uh, outer measure uh, will be just the tube null uh, sets and their complements. Uh, so the measure itself is not, at least uh, the, uh, the, the the measurable sigma algebra is not very interesting. Uh, I don't understand. So if you take a square, you need to measure the square. <laughs> then that can be covered by a strip of uh, oh, Maybe I misunderstood. Uh, uh, that's true, but still, uh, this defines an outer measure, yeah. and then you can find uh, those sets uh, that, measure. that are measurable, and they turn out to be just the tube null sets and their complements, nothing else. So the unit square is not measurable? No. Huh. Um, so it's, it's not very interesting to consider that measure. Yeah. Um, so, but why, why do we consider these two null sets? Uh, well, uh, they uh, came about in a paper of Carberry, Sori, and Vargas. Um, <coughs> they were looking at uh, this uh, problem of uh, Fourier inverse, if you like. So uh, <laughs> if you have uh, a function in the L2, space of the d-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, then uh, you can consider the Fourier transform uh, f hat. Uh, and uh, then you can consider these uh, uh, Fourier uh, means. So at a point x, we define this uh, as the, <coughs> mm, say, I don't know. Uh, 1 over uh, r to the d, you just take the average uh, of the, uh, so you take the, So if you uh, integrate uh, this on the ball uh, of radius 
uh, r <coughs> and take uh, its average, uh, maybe with some constant, uh, then uh, you expect uh, this quantity uh, to converge to uh, the original uh, function uh, as uh, r goes to infinity, right? Uh, this would be some kind of Fourier inverse property. And uh, this is true uh, in uh, one dimension. This is open, however, in higher dimension uh, in, in this generality. So what uh, they proved is that uh, if you uh, have the extra condition that uh, you take some <coughs> domain Uh, yeah, well, uh, whether uh, this converges uh, uh, for almost every x? Uh, yes, I think so. It's not, it's not like it's false. It's an open. No one knows the, the x term. Yes, the wow. conjecture it's is. It's like a 19th century. Uh, and yeah, and it is. Uh, it's just not proved for higher dimension yet. Uh, so uh, what they managed to prove is that if you have uh, like uh, a domain uh, omega, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we can just uh, assume this to be the unit ball. Um, and if you assume that, uh, say, f is in the L2 uh, space uh, and uh, the support of f is completely outside uh, omega, so uh, their intersection is empty. So you have a function that uh, lives outside the unit ball. Then uh, inside the unit ball, for any x inside the unit ball, uh, these means should converge to zero, right? Uh, and uh, well, and almost everywhere this is true. So uh, in this case, uh, this S sub R, uh, probably it should also depend on <coughs> F. Uh, so this should, uh, this converges to zero uh, for uh, almost every X in uh, this domain omega. Okay, uh, and, and this is where tube null sets uh, uh, came to the picture because uh, they asked, okay, uh, this is true for almost every uh, x, but what about the exceptional sets? Uh, like, can we say something about the exceptional sets? Uh, they surely have uh, measure zero, but maybe something more. Uh, and uh, this is what they called uh, SDLP, uh, the set of divergence for the localization problem. So whatever set can appear as an exceptional set, they call it an SDLP. Uh, and uh, the conjecture is that SDLPs are exactly the tube null sets. Um, so what uh, they proved is that if something is tube null, that then it can appear uh, as, an, as, a, as an exceptional set. Uh, this direction, they conjecture it to be true, but they uh, don't know. So, <coughs> so potential these tube null sets uh, are uh, the sets that can appear as exceptional sets in this uh, very nice and very classical uh, problem. Now, uh, I want to start with a few simple observations about tube null sets. For uh, so all tube null uh, sets has Lebesgue measure zero. Uh, this we, we can obviously assume that uh, our tube null set is uh, bounded, and if it is bounded, then uh, then of course whenever we have a strip, then it has some bounded length. Uh, so if the total width uh, is less than epsilon, then the total area of the strips uh, that we cover with uh, is, of course, this uh, bound for the length times the total width, which still converges to uh, zero. 
So uh, any tube null set has Lebesgue measure zero. Um, another uh, very simple observation is that if we uh, have a set uh, whose projection uh, to some uh, line, one dimensional line, uh, so if this projection has uh, measure zero, that is one dimensional Lebesgue measure zero, then uh, of course, uh, our set is tube null because in this case we can simply uh, uh, cover uh, this projection with intervals of total uh, lengths less than epsilon and then uh, use strips in only one direction, the direction perpendicular to the line, <coughs> and then we can cover uh, our set using such uh, strips. Now, uh, uh, a simple consequence of this fact is that uh, any purely unrectifiable one set is tube null. Uh, now, this is, uh, this is a <coughs> uh, geometric measure theoretic, theoretic uh, term, purely unrectifiable. Uh, it's, um, so you don't really want to, I, I won't really need uh, too many uh, definitions uh, from geometric measure theory. Uh, I will uh, use the notion of uh, Hausdorff uh, measures and Hausdorff dimension uh, if uh, it's not something very important to, to know if you don't know these definitions. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just uh, quickly explain what a pure non-rectifiable one set is though. Uh, so uh, uh, any set uh, on uh, in the plane uh, has a uh, house of dimension. It's somewhere between zero and two. Uh, and uh, for any uh, S uh, between zero and two, there is a measure, the S dimensional house of uh, <coughs> measure denoted by H uh, S, uh, which, uh, uh, which, which basically uh, measures uh, things that are uh, as dimensional. Anything that uh, is less than as dimensional will have zero HS me uh, measure. Anything that has large, uh, whose dimension is larger than S will have infinite uh, HS uh, measure. And uh, something is called an S set uh, if its uh, HS measure is positive uh, but finite. Uh, so uh, an S set is really something that uh, uh, H S measures uh, well. Uh, so uh, a one set is something whose dimension, house of dimension is one, but on top of that, uh, it's H one measure, which is just a linear measure, uh, basically measuring the lengths of, of curves. Uh, so uh, this, this linear measure uh, is positive and finite. Now, uh, such sets uh, can be decomposed into rectifiable parts and purely unrectifiable parts. Uh, the rectifiable parts are the ones that can be covered using rectifiable curves or graphs of Lipschitz functions. Uh, so, uh, so the parts that are nice curves. And then there's the pu purely unrectifiable part with the property that if you take the intersection of the set with any uh, rectifiable curve, the linear measure uh, of the intersection will be zero. So uh, there's a part uh, that, uh, uh, that can, that, that are curve-like, uh, that, that's, that's curve-like, and then there's the other part which uh, is not curve-like, something like this. Uh, and uh, the, there are these famous theorems uh, in geometric measure theory, the projection theorems uh, that uh, say something about uh, the projection of sets and their house of dimension. Uh, and one special case is uh, when you have uh, a one set and uh, then whether the projection uh, has, uh, so you can consider the projection to different uh, lines uh, and then you can uh, look at the measure of the projections and uh, whether these are, uh, the, uh, they have positive measure or zero measure depends on uh, the fact whether it's a purely unrectifiable uh, thing or whether it contains a rectifiable part. If it contains a rectifiable part, then the projection uh, will 
be <coughs> of positive uh, measure, uh, maybe with one exception, uh, one direction, uh, one exceptional direction. And if uh, we have a purely unrectifiable one set, then uh, in almost every direction, the projection will have uh, measure zero. Uh, so uh, since uh, for a purely unrectifiable one set, uh, this property will be satisfied in almost every direction. Uh, so it will be a tube null set. Now, an e easy consequence of this is that if something has a f uh, finite linear measure or sigma finite linear measure, then it is surely tube null. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, the question is, um, uh, so here's, here's another example uh, for uh, sets that are tube null and not tube null. Uh, so basically, we have a set H, say between 1 and 2, uh, in the interval 1, 2. And uh, this will be the set of radii. Uh, and then we, uh, we consider a fixed uh, origin, and we consider, uh, <coughs> we consider uh, circles around this fixed origin with uh, these, uh, uh, with uh, with, 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 with radius inside this set uh, H. And uh, the union of all these circles will be denoted by eight, e, e sub uh, H. And uh, it turns out that uh, whether this is tube null or not depends on the Hausdorff dimension of the set of radii. If the, <coughs> if, if the Hausdorff dimension is less than one half, then it's tube null. If it's larger than one half, then it's not uh, tube null. Uh, but um, it's... Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, this way, uh, the smallest, uh, the, uh, so if we are interested in, in, in constructing uh, non-tube null sets, then the s uh, smallest Hausdorff dimension that we can get is 3 half. Because if <coughs> this is larger than 1 half, then E sub H will have dimension uh, more than 3 half. So uh, it was, I guess uh, it used to be an open question whether uh, there is any uh, set uh, with Hausdorff dimension less than 3 half that is not tube null. <coughs> uh, I, will, I will come back to that. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, let me say a few words about uh, how to prove that something is not tube null. Uh, so if we want to prove, if we are given a set and we want to prove that it's tube null, well, theory, uh, in theory, it's very easy. You just have to provide uh, uh, coverings with strips uh, of arbitrary small total widths. And if you can do that, uh, you prove that it's tube null. Okay, how can you prove that something is not uh, tube null? Well, one possible method would be uh, to construct a measure uh, mu that is concentrated on your set E, uh, which takes a strictly positive value for the whole set, and that has the property that uh, there is this constant C, capital C, such that <coughs> the measure of any, uh, any strip with respect to this measure uh, is, is bounded by uh, the widths, uh, well, c times the widths of the um, of the um, of the strip. So, you want to construct measures uh, that are bounded by uh, the some constant multiple of the widths measure, uh, but still take some strictly positive value uh, for your set. If you can do this, then easy calculation shows that uh, the <coughs> you 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 cannot cover your set with arbitrary small total widths uh, using strips. Uh, of course, another way to say this is that to find a, a measure mu such that if you project it to any line, then it will be absolutely continuous with, radon, with bounded radon nicotine derivative. Uh, that's exactly the same thing. So this is one possible method. But it turns out that uh, actually, uh, this seems to be the only uh, 
possible method, the only known method. Uh, uh, whenever somebody uh, proved that something is not tubenal, uh, they always constructed such a measure. Uh, and there is uh, a conjecture uh, that for any non-tubenal set, uh, one can find uh, such a measure. So uh, according to this conjecture, this would be the only reason why uh, a set should be tubenal because of the existence of uh, such a measure. This is open as well, but uh, so, uh, so you, you, we have this set of divergence which might be equivalent uh, to being tube null, uh, and being tube null might be equivalent to uh, this non-existence of such a, uh, such a measure. So there are a few uh, interesting open questions. Now, uh, so I mentioned that uh, for a while, uh, people couldn't construct uh, tubenal sets uh, that non-tubenal sets uh, with Hausdorff dimension less than three uh, half. Uh, and uh, so usually, uh, fractals of sets, similar sets, uh, are good candidates uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for tubenal sets or non-tubenal sets. Uh, they also, uh, uh, usually, they also come with some uh, self-similar measure on them. Uh, that uh, might be useful to um, to, to consider uh, uh, when we, when one wants to prove that it's it's non uh, tubenal. Uh, however, uh, it's uh, it turns out that it's not so easy to prove uh, uh, this uh, property about the measure. Uh, and uh, uh, what people did instead is that uh, they <coughs> looked at random fractals, so-called fractal. Uh, percolations. So what, what is a fractal percolation? Uh, this will be a random set, basically, so not one concrete uh, uh, fractal, uh, but instead, uh, well, you could uh, start with uh, the unit square, and then uh, you <coughs> put uh, an n, pi, n by n grid on it. In this case, n equals 3. So you have, uh, you might not see these uh, black lines, uh, but uh, there is a, a three times three grid on this. And then for each grid, uh, 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 for each little uh, squares, you decide uh, whether uh, you, uh, you color it to red or color it to blue. If you color it to red, then you throw that away. Uh, for the blue squares, uh, you uh, uh, repeat the same process. Each blue square will be uh, divided into uh, n uh, times n little squares. Uh, I for each little square independently and maybe with some uh, positive given probability, you decide whether it's blue or red uh, and uh, you, uh, you keep doing that. And then uh, in the end, uh, you will just take the intersection of all the blue sets and this will give you uh, a random compact set. Uh, and this is this is your set, and then you can uh, prove uh, a lot of things about them with probability, with high probability, uh, such a set will have host of dimension this and this, uh, or with high probability, such a set will not be tube null. So uh, what they managed to prove is that uh, they proved the existence of a set of host of di dimension one uh, that is not tube null. So not only uh, you can go below uh, three half, uh, you can uh, go <coughs> uh, as low as one. So um, if yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, with positive probability, <coughs> with positive probability, this will be an empty set. But if you don't consider that. Uh, yeah, if you exclude uh, the emptiness, then uh, yes, it will. Uh, such sets will have uh, constant, uh, constant host of dimension. Um, so, uh, and uh, the proof that it's not tube null uh, is uh, the same uh, thing. Uh, uh, they constructed a random measure on this random set. Uh, with, uh, the <coughs> with the properties that we mentioned uh, before. Um, so what, uh, 
what I want to uh, uh, talk about in the rest of the time, basically, uh, is just one concrete uh, example. Uh, so we, uh, uh, so it turns out that it's very, uh, in, in many cases, it's very hard to tell uh, about concrete fractals, concrete self-similar sets, whether they are tubular uh, or not. Uh, so one of the most studied. Uh, Yeah. Can you produce higher dimensional random sets? Is there a general way? Uh, yeah. Uh, random fractals? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, it works for any dimension larger than uh, one. One? Uh, but, it does, but it, you cannot prove that, it, that there are non, non tubing ones among them? Yeah, 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 yeah. They are, uh, uh, they, they, they are not, they are not sure. tubing ones, but. Them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, but the point is that. Uh, uh, that if the H1 measure is finite, or even sigma finite, yeah. uh, then we know that it's tube null. Right. Uh, so the, the, uh, if we want to have non-tube null sets, the best we can hope for is something uh, who is one-dimensional, but not even uh, sigma finite H1 measure. Right. Uh, so it turns out that uh, there are uh, such one-dimensional sets, uh, which are not tube null, which is quite surprising. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, the reason for that is that they don't have sigma finite H1 measure. Um, so uh, this snowflake curve, uh, one of the most studied uh, uh, sat-similar sets, uh, so you start with a segment. Uh, and then you replace this segment with uh, four uh, smaller segments. Each has length one third of the original one. I don't know how well you can see this. And then uh, for each such smaller segment, uh, yeah, it's not very good. Uh, you uh, keep doing that. So you replace this uh, with uh, four. Uh, smaller segments now they each have uh, each has length uh, one ninth of the original one uh, so this is level two now you have uh, uh, four to the two uh, segments so at level n you have four to the n segments uh, of lengths three to the minus uh, n and then uh, each of these uh, at uh, step m plus 1, you replace uh, them like this. And then uh, what you get in the limit uh, is this uh, snowflake uh, curve, which is a self-similar curve. So uh, Mariana Czernia asked this question, uh, whether the snowflake uh, curve is tube null uh, or not. And uh, you know, we know a lot about the uh, snowflake curve, but still, uh, for a while, uh, we couldn't answer this uh, question. Um, and then it uh, turned out that the snowflake curve is tube null, uh, so it can be covered uh, by strips of arbitrary small total widths. Uh, and actually, uh, you can say even more <coughs> So uh, this snowflake curve has a decomposition. So you can uh, partition it into three parts. Uh, and then there will be three directions. Well, it's not. Uh, so there will be the horizontal direction, and then the uh, two directions, uh, two 60 degree directions. Uh, so if, uh, you, uh, if you project uh, your uh, the three parts uh, onto, onto these three lines corresponding to these three directions, uh, then, well, uh, what we would need is that uh, the projections uh, have measure zero, right? Because if they uh, have measure zero, then uh, uh, in the perpendicular direction, you can uh, consider strips and using uh, strips in these three directions uh, would give you uh, a cover of the snowflake curve. Uh, not only the uh, projections will have measure zero, 
uh, on those lines, but actually their host of dimension will be strictly less than uh, one. Uh, so uh, basically you can decompose the uh, snowflake curve into three parts in a way that uh, uh, for each part there corresponds a direction in which direction uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at uh, that in that direction it will be the cross section will be very very small even in terms of host of dimension less than one uh, <coughs> so um, yeah, this is just a, a concrete uh, uh, fractal, and the proof uh, is uh, really about this uh, very uh, concrete uh, set. Uh, so it's, in that sense, it's not very interesting, uh, but uh, the proof is uh, a lot of fun, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite surprising that uh, it, it works for this set, so uh, I just want to uh, I just want to try to quickly explain to you the proof. Uh, and the proof will actually uh, use some funny guys, uh, these uh, three uh, Pac-Man. And um, what these three, uh, pac these are one dimensional Pac-Man, so we will, uh, we will put them uh, on a line, so we will have a sequence of Pac-Mans. In each position, there will be either one of these three guys, and then. Uh, and uh, the street, the Z, right? Yeah. Okay. So we will have a, a, a sequence of Pac-Mans of lengths n, uh, and uh, and they can uh, eat each other. Well, this guy uh, has uh, has a mouth on the right, so it can only eat things uh, uh, that uh, are to the right uh, of him. And uh, then this guy can uh, uh, eat uh, to the left. Uh, this guy is, doesn't really have a big mouth. He's a vegetarian. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't eat uh, other uh, Pac-Mans. Uh, and also, this has uh, uh, spikes here. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, it cannot be eaten from the right. So only uh, orange guys can eat. This is, by the way, blue. <laughs> uh, so uh, green, sorry. So this green guy can only be eaten by this one, uh, not by this one. Uh, this orange guy can eat other orange guys. Uh, this uh, can eat other uh, yellow uh, guys. And this is larger than this, so yellow guys can eat orange guys. OK, the uh, point is that we have these rules. Uh, uh, orange uh, can eat the green, uh, the yellow can eat the orange, uh, uh, and and what is green? this is green. That's green. Yeah. Okay. So these are the rules, uh, and um, and the question. So what? Sorry, I'm confused. Go back. What? Orange guy eats the green guy, the spiky guy, that is just one. Oh, I see. I see. The guys don't change. Yeah, uh, yeah. So these these are cannibals, uh, but only the yellow cannibals eat the orange cannibals because they are larger. Okay. Anyway, these these are the rules, uh, and this is okay. No, no political. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I want to. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that uh, <laughs> this. Uh, no, no, no uh, political, uh, you know, things. Between, so don't read anything right. uh, between the lines. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you have a sequence of uh, of such uh, Pac-Man, uh, then they uh, there will be a lot of cancellations, and in the end, you get this because this guy eats uh, uh, all the other yellows, and then this orange eats these two. Uh, but then when uh, this one has eaten this one, it will be eaten by this one. Uh, so, uh, so this is what you get in the end, and then uh, you, some, something else happens uh, in the front. Yeah, it doesn't matter which order you put? Yeah, it's, well, I mean, no, not necessarily. But uh, uh, I know where these guys uh, come from. And uh, since uh, they are two by two matrices, uh, <laughs> And 
uh, yeah. So you, you'll see. But uh, two, by two. <laughs> two, two by two, yeah. Um, so the question is, if you have a random sequence of uh, such Pac-Mans, then uh, what happens? What is the probability of survival? And it turns out that if the probability of survival is less than one third, then the snowflake curve is tube null. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the uh, and uh, basically in the rest of the talk I will try to talk uh, uh, try to explain what's the uh, it means that uh, you you have this uh, random sequence of lengths n. n and then uh, if uh, the uh, some random stuff happens and in the end uh, you will have uh, uh, a random number of uh, of Pac-Man left, yeah. and if that's less than n third, less than the third of the original, oh, okay. then well, you can just uh, look at a random uh, uh, a random Pac-Man and asks with what what probability will it survive all the cancellations? So you're really talking about the expected number of guys left. Uh, yeah. Divided by n. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, and it turns out that uh, it is less than one third. So after all the cancellations, uh, uh, with high probability, less than uh, n third uh, or Pac-Man will survive, uh, which will prove that the snowflake curve can be covered efficiently using strips. Okay, so uh, what do uh, Pac-Man have to do with uh, the snowflake uh, curve. So, uh, so these are the, uh, the covering numbers. Uh, so, so we have the snowflake curve here, and then uh, we have uh, a little piece a level n uh, piece somewhere here. It is similar to the original curve. So this is so the, uh, this little piece is similar to the original curve. Uh, is just uh, smaller. Uh, so you, the easiest thing uh, is just to think of it as an equilateral triangle. Uh, so uh, you have this. Uh, so what we will call it a level N piece. Uh, it connects two uh, vertices of this level N triangle. And um, what we will consider is uh, these uh, strips in these three directions, th three main directions. Right? Uh, these are called the level N strips. And uh, if, you, if you look at the level N strip, it will cover this level N piece. But it will also cover other level N pieces. So there are four to the N level N pieces. Uh, and for example, uh, this one here, uh, this horizontal strip, will cover 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of these. So the covering number of this level N strip will be 10. Uh, so this strip covers 10 level N strips. And maybe this one covers only 6, and this uh, one covers 3. So every uh, strip, every level N strip, has a covering number. and uh, what we do is that, of course, we want to uh, cover the whole curve using as few strips as possible. So what we do is that we choose strips with large covering numbers, uh, sort of a greedy uh, thing to do. Uh, so, uh, so we would need the fact that every piece, every level M piece of the curve is covered uh, by a strip whose covering number is large. Because then we can just uh, pick the 
strips with large covering numbers, and then they will cover the whole thing. So, uh, and luckily, uh, we have this proposition. Uh, if you pick any level M piece uh, and take the three strips going through it and look at the covering numbers of these strips, their product will be at least uh, 2 to the n. Uh, this is the claim. And of course, uh, before we prove it, uh, the corollary is that uh, at least one of the three uh, strips will have covering number 2 to the n over 3, right? Uh, so at least one of them will have a fairly large uh, covering number, uh, if you like. Okay, uh, and it's very simple to prove uh, this statement that the product is at least 2 to the n, uh, and it's because if if you have this little piece, for example, here, uh, then uh, we have these three uh, level n uh, strips. And, but this level n piece uh, can be considered as a level n minus 1 piece in this level 1 piece. Okay? So, uh, the curve is decomposed into four level one pieces. This is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. In exactly one of them will, uh, uh, will contain our uh, level M piece. So this one. Uh, and this level M piece in this level one piece will be just a level M minus one piece. So if you consider the same strips, those will be level M minus one strips of this little piece. So their product, the covering, product of the covering numbers, will be at least 2 to the n minus 1. But uh, if you look at the horizontal strip, its covering number as a level n strip uh, of the whole curve will be at least twice as large uh, as the covering number uh, uh, in this piece. It, it will not be a horizontal strip anymore in this piece, but uh, you know we, we just permute a little bit the covering numbers, and then one of them, the uh, the horizontal one, uh, will be twice as large, at least twice as large in this one, uh, because we have this symmetry. Uh, we always have uh, a symmetric uh, piece. Uh, so uh, this by induction proves that. Uh, the product of the covering numbers is at least 2 to the n, which in turn proves... What, what, what I'm confused. That direction, yeah, exactly. How about the other direction? Well, uh, the, the other direction, at least as much. Uh, the covering... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so basically, we always have three numbers. And then when we uh, consider... Uh, in the whole uh, graph, then we s a little bit we permute them, and at least and, and one of them uh, will be doubled. So, yeah. Um, so this is a very simple uh, argument uh, proving that uh, at least one of the three covering numbers will be at least two to the n over three. Uh, so what we do, as I said, uh, we will just pick uh, all these uh, strips, level n strips, with covering number at least two to the n. Uh, over 3. And according to the corollary, these strips will cover k. Uh, so what we need uh, to show is that their number, the number of such strips, uh, will be small compared to the total number, which is 3 to the n. Um, so, uh, so next, we want to uh, get an estimate uh, on how many uh, strips we have with covering number uh, at least 2 to the n third. And our goal will be to prove that it's, uh, it's, much, it, it's very small compared to 3 to the n. Because uh, this is uh, 3 to the minus n is basically the width of a level n strip. So if we have, uh, if we multiply the number of such strips with 3 to the minus n, and if this goes to 0, then the total width will go to the converge to zero. 
So the problem is that we need to somehow determine the covering numbers. Uh, and uh, ideally, uh, we would uh, uh, Um, so we have a strip, say a horizontal strip, and we know that it covers a few pieces, uh, maybe 10. And then uh, at the next level, this will have three sub-strips. And we know that uh, maybe this is 10, and then we somehow uh, need to determine uh, the covering number of the substrips. But all we know is that their sum will be uh, 40 because uh, this level n strip covered 10 level n pieces, uh, which contains altogether 40 level n plus 1 pieces. Uh, so these three stri strips uh, in total have a covering number 40. But we don't know how it's distributed uh, uh, between them. And the sad fact is that simply knowing this number 10 uh, will not enable us to find out uh, these numbers. Uh, we uh, need to keep track of uh, not just the number of, um, of covered pieces, uh, but uh, the types uh, of covered pieces. So basically, uh, we have. So this is, this is a level n strip. Uh, and you can have this equilateral triangle here that, and then the level n piece can connect these two pieces or these two pieces or these two pieces. And then uh, your equilateral triangle can be like this. Uh, and then, so basically there are six different types of, uh, of pieces. Uh, when covered by uh, a strip, uh, these six different types. And it turns out that uh, there are two orientations. So uh, uh, you either have these three types or these three types for a given strip. Uh, cannot be mixed, the two uh, orientations. Uh, and uh, then what's important for us is the number of, uh, so this, this we call a border piece because it it doesn't cross the strip. It uh, stays completely in one of the sub-strips, the three sub-strips. Uh, and then these two are cro crossing pieces. This is how they find them. And uh, uh, a covering vector will be just, uh, we keep track of the number of border pieces and we keep track of the number of crossing pieces as well, not just their sum. Their sum is the covering number. Uh, but we will need to know the number of border pieces and the number of crossing pieces separately. Uh, and once we have that, once we have this vector, uh, a vector here, for example, uh, 6, 4, uh, will determine uh, all the three uh, sub-vectors, if you like. Uh, so the covering vector determines the three next level covering vectors completely. Uh, and it's, it's very easy. You just uh, look at the different pieces and look at uh, how many sub-pieces will this contain, this contain, this contain. It's just very easy. You look at the figure. And it turns out that uh, these will be the three uh, covering uh, vectors. And this is where the 2 by 2 matrices come uh, into the picture, because this is just simply uh, multiplication by uh, these uh, matrices. Uh, so. What you do uh, to, get, um, to get the covering numbers, uh, you fix a direction, uh, and you take the level 0 uh, strip in that direction, and uh, you take the covering vector. It's either 1, 0, or <coughs> 0, 1, depending whether you pick the horizontal one or one of the other two directions. Uh, and then uh, you start uh, multiplying uh, this uh, covering vector, V, either 1, 0, or 0, 1, uh, from the right uh, by uh, one of these uh, matrices. Uh, and uh, each matrix MI is, uh, is one of the three matrices A, B, C. So uh, uh, in the end, you will get 3 to the n 
possible sequences. And these 3 to the n possible sequences will uh, correspond to the 3 to the n uh, possible covering vectors in that uh, direction. So this is how you can generate all covering vectors. Uh, and then if you want to get the covering number, uh, you just uh, add them up. Uh, so you multiply with this uh, vector from the right. Uh, anyway, what we have to understand is just simply uh, what do we get uh, if we uh, uh, start with these three matrices here and you take a random product uh, of lengths n. And this, this could be something that uh, can, could, could be uh, examined generally, like uh, you pick, uh, you, you have a finitely many uh, matrices and uh, at each position you pick one uniform random and you are interested in uh, in the product, what happens? Uh, will the product be concentrated? Uh, and I believe that in general, this, this should be a very hard uh, question. This should be something that, uh, uh, that's, that's hard to, uh, to answer. Uh, but in this uh, special case, we are lucky because of, uh, uh, there are certain rules. Uh, if you uh, take the product of B and A, you get B, uh, which in other, another language means that B can eat A uh, if it's in front of him. Uh, and then uh, there are uh, three uh, further uh, rules. Uh, and at this point, uh, you will just have a random sequence of letters uh, with uh, certain rules. And if you do all the cancellations, uh, you, uh, you get something like this. Uh, and, and this. Uh, product can, uh, can actually be uh, computed. So uh, basically what happens, uh, I don't want to uh, go into the details, but what happens is that uh, the covering number will basically depend uh, on the reduced length, on the number of letters uh, uh, remained after we did all the cancellations. Uh, so Basically, the new problem is that uh, we take a, a random sequence of letters A, B, C. We uh, perform all possible cancellations uh, if we have these four rules. Uh, and then uh, we look at the reduced lengths of such random sequence. And what we need is that it's, uh, uh, it's less than n. This reduced length should be less than n third uh, minus some constant. Uh, because if this is true, then uh, with the, uh, <coughs> at least with high probability, uh, then we get that the covering number of a random strip uh, will, be, uh, will be less than two to the n over three with high probability. So only with very small probability will be the covering number, uh, will, will the covering number be larger than two to the n over three. And since we only need to pick the ones with covering number uh, at least 2 to the n over 3, uh, this is just a small number of strips, uh, we are basically done. No, that's, that's, uh, pr pr that's pretty much what it is. Uh, and Actually, the reduced lengths uh, will be uh, not, not just less than one third of the original lengths, but uh, the exact number is uh, five, a, five over eighteen, or something like that. Uh, and it, hmm? yes. Uh, so, because basically, if you think about it, uh, whenever you have uh, an orange guy. What, ha what will happen to the orange guy? Well, <clears throat> it will eat anything uh, in front of him uh, as long as it's another orange guy or a green guy. Uh, and it will eat until uh, it bumps into a yellow guy, which will eat him in turn. So uh, the orange guy will uh, eat until eaten. 
so no orange guy basically will survive. Only if, if it's at the end of the sequence. Uh, so basically the survival probability is zero here. Um, this guy will survive with uh, uh, one half. Why is that true? Uh, Uh, okay, yeah, so the first non-green guy left of him will decide whether it survives or not. If the first non-green guy is orange, it will die. If the first non-green guy uh, to the left is a yellow, it will survive. Very good. Uh, and this will survive with probability one-third because um, some similar argument. Uh, it... You, you have to look at what it's uh, on the uh, right. Uh, if and if there is such a guy before a yellow guy, or something. yeah, uh, this will this will protect him. This is the only thing that protects him. If if not a green, if if the next guy is not green, uh, then uh, if it's if it's an orange. Eventually, the orange will eat itself until a yellow, which will eat the orange and eat this guy. Uh, if, if there's a, a, another yellow to the right of him, then it will get eaten right away. So the only way to survive for this is if uh, it has a green neighbor on its right. So, um, so basically, the probability of survival is uh, 5 over 18, which is strictly less than 1 third. And then you can make this uh, precise and get a statement uh, uh, that is something like this. The reduced length is at least n3 minus c not with uh, an exponentially small probability, uh, which will then prove uh, the statement. So this is, this is how you can use uh, Beckmanian mathematics. Thanks. Thank you.